Americans have a profound aversion to injustice, often rallying to rectify it, be it for civil rights, the fight for women's suffrage, or the unfettered access to education. Today, we confront a new statewide challenge to fairness known as California's Proposition 19. Prior to this law, children could inherit a parent's property and maintain the assessed valuation. Under Prop 19, those rights have been revised to the detriment of several groups, specifically the middle class and low-income groups. So the question is, how has Prop 19 changed a child's inheritance of a deceased parent's property, and what are the proposed modifications to fix the situation? My name is Jim Connor. Welcome to Game Changers Silicon Valley. My guest on this topic is Gina C. Louie, a leader and advocate of the Fix Prop 19 campaign. Gina, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Jim. You're at the forefront of efforts to address this unfair shift in tax policy. Can you give us an overview of how this occurred how the, and what the unintended or intended consequences have been? So Proposition 13 was passed in 1978. In 1986, they passed Proposition 58 which gave the rights of transfer of property tax assessments to children. In 1996, they passed Proposition 193, which gave the transfer rights to grandchildren. Both 58 and 193 were actually put on by the legislators. Proposition 19 was put on by the legislators and now takes away the rights of Proposition 58 and 193. But I had the impression, right or wrong, that propositions came from voter, uh, some type of voter movement? Well, we have a supermajority. And so because we have a supermajority with a two thirds vote, they put Proposition 19 on the ballot. The legislature did? Yes. And that took a two thirds vote of both the assembly and the Senate? Correct. And that occurred, so that appeared as a proposition. I was under the mistaken impression that propositions always came from the voters, basically one way or another. Well, unfortunately, yeah. they don't always come from the voters, and we're going to see that uh, in this upcoming November 2024 ballot, because there's a lot of initiatives that have been proposed by uh, citizens. Can they get the 1.3 million signatures due to the 30% invalidity rate? 30% invalidity. Okay, well, we'll talk about that in a few minutes here. But um, So if I get it right now, Proposition 13 comes out, puts a limit on property taxes, the increase of the property taxes, and then... Uh, these other two propositions come along and say, well, you also have the right to transfer property to your children, and they get the same tax basis for that property. And then the other one, 193, yeah. also applies to grandchildren. Yes. So everybody's happy, more or less. Who's unhappy? Well, right now, who's unhappy is everyone who wants money in the government for public services. Because they feel that if they can have people sell, we can get more affordable housing. We can actually enhance public services. Uh, Proposition 19 was passed for wildfire victims to basically give money to Cal Fire. In the last two years that it's been passed and effective, no money has gone to wildfire. I did have some uh, follow-up research with a couple people who had been hurt and, and experienced the pain of Proposition 19 and their one individual. Gave me a very clear uh, lay of the land, if you will. He said, there are three components. The first one that if your house is burned down or destroyed by a flood, any kind of disaster type thing, you get to buy a new property more for more value and carry your tax basis forward. So right? that's the portability feature. Portability. And we're not touching that. Right. And we want to yeah. make clear we're not touching that. Second one was if you're 55 years or older, you get to transfer or you get to move three times and carry the tax base of your property that you owned at 55 three times forward. And that's portability and we're not touching that either. All right. And then the third one we're going to talk more about here where... <laughs> It's pretty complicated, frankly, that if you are, uh, if you as a child inherit a property, any a, a primary residence from your parent, um, there's some exclusions. I'll let you talk about that. But basically, you do not get to carry the tax basis forward. And if you do want to apply, you have to move into the property. Correct? That's correct. All right. So the first two comments I got back were. There aren't that many people whose houses burned down anymore. There just aren't that many. It happens. But, the, you know, we're talking maybe 10, 20, 30 people, maybe a few more. Well, and here's the thing, is that they sold it based on the fact that if people basically had their houses burnt down during wildfires, who pays for that? It's going to be insurance anyways. Mm -hmm. And until you get the insurance to build the house, you can't transfer that home to another county. And, and transferring those homes, it's going to blight the area. 
So it's actually not a good thing. Mm -hmm. Transfer the homes where? Instead? Well, you can relocate anywhere in California oh, I see. because of the portability. Yeah. But now you're blighting that area. Meaning you're not going to rebuild where it was burned down. Well, you, you have to rebuild because oh. the insurance company is going to force you to rebuild that house, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, the other uh, second issue about the uh, when you're 55 years and older, you can transfer three times. This person who had been burned very badly said, who's going to do that three times at the age of 55? You know, your income, you're getting ready to retire. You're in the last five, maybe 10 years of your career. You're probably not going to take on a lot of new debt. You might move once at most. So that was sort of a non-starter for him. Well, in the 2010 census, I looked at the amount of relocations from seniors, and it was like 100,000 people a year. So you're looking at basically affecting 40 million Californians at that time based on 100,000 moves. Then the third one is the most complex of all. And I'll give you my sense, because I'm sure I've got it a little bit misaligned or incorrect, but if I can get this right. Um, you, first of all, you, it has to be the parent's primary residence, and the last parent passes away. Okay. A child, I believe, can uh, inherit that property. Uh, well, would by will, or one way or another, by trust, inherit the property. Now the government says, the state of California, we're going to reassess the value of the property, and one of two things happens. You either move in and live there within a year, and then we'll take the current market value less $1 million. Is that correct? So the, the easiest way to do the calculation is add whatever your taxable base is and $1 million. Oh, okay, I had it backwards. And yeah. then basically take the market value and subtract whatever that addition was. And then take whatever's remaining and add that to the former tax base. Can we use an example? Because I can't quite <laughs> Sure. <follow that. laughs> so let's assume that the tax base is 300000 okay. right? And so you add the $1 million, so you get $1.3 million. Right. Now the property value is worth $1.5 million. Right? Oh, so you okay. subtract the 1.3 from the 1.5, now you have 200,000. So your new taxable base is 500,000. Okay, okay, I got you. But imagine a lot of these homes now in California are like two and a half million. So now you're talking a property tax of one and a half million and $20,000 in property taxes when the average income in California is like 70 something, almost $80,000. Mm -hmm. So how does someone pay a property tax of $20,000 a year? when the average Social Security, they say, is only 1700 a month. The person I spoke to, a uh, generous guy with his time and knowledge and information and experience, uh, essentially lived in his mother's house as a caretaker for 20 years, I think. And uh, yeah. she had a tax basis of probably around six, 700000 I believe. The property's worth $4 million yeah. after that. So he was hit with this enormous bump up, and he really can't afford that kind of uh, property tax. Just can't afford it flat out. He's retired. You know, he's not working. So it's, a, it's devastating to him, and there's apparently no remedy at the moment, except sell the property. Yeah, and, and that's the thing is this was sold as help seniors, help disabled, help wildfire victims. Some of our volunteers are calling this a senior scam because just like you said, it's hurting seniors and it's hurting disabled people, right? Uh, when people are forced to leave their homes, most people, they live in the community. They want to stay in the community with their supports. Now they're forced to sell the home. What are they going to do? Start over at 60, 70, 80 years, 90 years of age? Because we're living longer. So when are people inheriting properties in their golden years? Tell me about the fix-it remedy that you're proposing. So it's actually fixed Prop 19. And the reason why we say fixed Prop 19 is we want to be clear that we are keeping the portability. The campaign name is actually Repeal the Death Tax, and it's being sponsored by the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. So we're saying fix Prop 19 by repeal the death tax. i got to ask you a couple of thoughts. So um, why, in your mind, it's your opinion, of course, did the legislature not correct this? They apparently, from what I read, they have two chances to correct it, and they didn't either. Well, they've had more than two chances to correct it. Okay. Um, unfortunately, uh, Patricia Bates tried to put something on. Uh, Kevin Kiley tried to put something on. And then uh, Ciarto tried to put on the latest, which was SCA4, and they didn't correct it through any of those. Um, the reasons why they claim is they need more money for affordable housing, they need more money for wildfire victims, but as we've talked about, they're not getting it. Two years, it's been a dry well, according to Senator Blakespear. For what I read, which may not be entirely accurate, the uh, Realtors Association was also behind the proposition. Is that right? Is that going to force more properties on the market? Or maybe I'm wrong about that. So I am a real estate broker. Oh, you are. And the sad thing is like, I pulled on hundreds of realtors 
to basically fight this. Um, unfortunately, as I, I mentioned to you in our previous discussions, that uh, I was fighting before it passed. And I was told by car directors, you need to stop. We spent $50 million on this. And I said, look, I'm not going to stop. This is not right. They said 900 directors across the state approved this. I'm like, it doesn't matter. I'm going to fight this, right? And when I went to the Phil Ting Town Hall uh, for Kevin Mullen's Congress run, Kevin Mullen, they tried to avoid me being on the mic, by the way. It was the craziest thing. I've never seen this ever before. And uh, when I finally got to talk to Kevin Mullen, he said, you know why we did this, right? We did it for wildfire. I'm not aware of any realtor-sponsored initiative, which is kind of crazy because they did actually set aside the car initiative and they got on the ballot late. That's the craziest thing. They made their own exception to put it on the ballot and it was late. So let me just get this right. The legislature comes up with a proposition, builds it out with maybe maybe some um, special interest considerations about this. They missed the deadline for submitting it to the election committee, I believe. They then decide that that's okay. They're going to make an exception. Was that a um, some kind of uh, special law, or did they yes. just do it? Oh, it was a special they law. They drafted their own SB to put it on. And, and the crazier thing is Phil Ting, I asked him to support us. And he said, well, I am against it. And I said, well, then why would you vote NVR? And NVR is no vote recorded. And he goes, that's how you vote against the party, right? Well, when I did further research into it, because like I said, before Prop 19, I was apolitical. I just didn't want to be involved. I found out that he was the introducer of ACA 11, which is Prop 19. It got hijacked somewhere along the way, and then Kevin Mullen was the final author who chaptered it. So you, um, being a real estate agent, now you're an advocate, and you're involved in all these laws in, in Sacramento. I just have to ask, what is going on in Sacramento? I mean, is there special interests? Or, I mean, we as a normal everyday voter, citizen, are totally bewildered. You never know what's going to come out of that group. What's your sense of it? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, this, I know we only have a limited amount of time, but this must be a very, this is a very important topic. So, as I mentioned, Senator Sayarto, he drafted SCA4 to turn this around. We had That's a constitutional something? For? Yeah, Senate constitutional amendment. Oh, yeah. So we had a special hearing that was supposed to be only us, but then they actually added something else. We had people coming from Southern California, Los Angeles, Glendale, Santa Barbara. We had like 40-something people from San Francisco all the way to Sacramento. It was sad because while we were giving our testimony as to why they should support turning this around, they were leaving the room. They were talking amongst themselves. And they denied us. And it's just like, you wonder why. So I ran into the chairperson, Caballero, in the hallway. And she said, find the money. It's all about special interests. The special interests take precedence over we the people. So we had a conversation earlier. I had to get this defined. What does find the money mean? And I came to understand that. It means that someone is funding the effort, and if you want a, your voice or your position to be competitive or considered, you have to also find the money to fund it, meaning donations to our campaigns. Is that accurate? It's potentially, you know, special interests that are funding their campaigns. I mean, uh, unfortunately, Wiener, who supposedly supports housing affordability, is basically backing a lot of bills that are reducing housing affordability. Like in San Francisco, we've got to have 30% affordable housing, right? Well, now they're reducing it to 10% because they're saying that the developers can't make money. In fact, on one project, I read that they're giving $25 million as a grant so that it's feasible to build. That's taxpayer money that's being given so that someone can profit. So what's the course of action? I have the, this is called the debt tax Pen, oh, I'm sorry, the repeal the death tax, which is how it's being kind of marketed at correct. this point. And this is a uh, petition, is that right? That's correct. So yeah. it's the repeal the death tax campaign. Mm -hmm. We need to obtain 1.3 million signatures by January 2024. What date in January? January 16th. 16th. And so this is November 9th. You got about uh, 60 days, right? 60 a little days. more over 60 days. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so we need everyone's help, and I really appreciate you putting us on today. How close are you? 
We're not close. Okay. That's the thing is that uh, we were told by HJTA that we haven't hit the 25% mark because if we hit the 25% mark, they have to notify the legislators and the legislators, if there's 131 days before the ballot, can put it on the ballot for us. Oh, okay. So we're hoping, like I said, for everyone to push. Last campaign, we got 402,000 valid signatures. There's no reason for us not to get the 402,000 and build off of that. Okay, so if the uh, anybody viewing this show has a call to action, it would be call your legislator in the state of California, your assembly person, your senator, and say, please put this on a ballot. Is that exactly. correct? Exactly. Okay, that's a short way, shorter way to do it immediately. Is that correct? Correct. Right? That would be oh, it. Great. Well, you've been great, uh, Gina. I um. Well, let's, first of all, I want to thank you for coming and explaining this. It's a very technical issue, and frankly, it confused me for a number of days. I had to do a little background work, and I'm still not totally clear, but you've helped clear up a lot of my misconceptions. So um, how would people follow up with you or the campaign directly? So we have a website called fourcalifornians.com. And my phone number is in the corner. We are using a Google Voice, so if I'm not available, we're transferring it like an office phone to other people to use, right? Um, go on the fourcalifornians.com website, uh, connect with us. There's a volunteer link, so you can sign up. We're asking people to volunteer whatever their skill bases are. We need people that, like the crew here, can volunteer and, you know, offer us whatever you can do, whether it's creating uh, videos, whether it's posting on social media, whatever. Okay. Thank you. I really want to thank you for coming by. It's been a, it's a very interesting story. The more shows we do about these issues, the more concerned I get, frankly. But I want to thank you for coming in today, and I do want to wish you every success going forward. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for joining us in this episode. If you gain insights from this conversation, share this show with your network. You can view all shows at our website, GameChangers.tv, as well as the podcast, Game Changers Silicon Valley. We look forward to your continued interest in upcoming shows.